Thank you, Chancellor uh, Perlman, a good morning, Regent Clare, faculty, parents, families, and most important, the final graduating class of 2012. You all deserve a round of applause. You have not only earned it, you have paid for it. From here forward, hopefully someone else will be paying you, which is a nice change, I can assure you. But as it turns out, those paychecks come with some strings attached. So sit back and enjoy your moment today. It is a terrific accomplishment that you have worked so hard to achieve. When the university invited me to join you here, they asked me to keep my remarks to a little over five minutes. I thought, that's perfect. One minute for every year it took me to graduate from here. <laughs> yes, I was here for five and a half years, finishing my undergraduate degree. Perhaps some of you are in the same boat. Don't worry, it's a good boat to be in. It was 16 years ago this month when I was sitting in the same seats here at the Bob Devaney Sports Center. As I flew back to Nebraska yesterday, I tried to think who was my commencement speaker. I emailed a couple friends and we could not come up with who it was. So uh, I promise you that this is the last forgettable speech that you'll have to sit through. Um, if you'd like to uh, rest your eyes for a few minutes, feel free, but have someone sitting next to you tap you on the shoulder when it's time to walk up here for your degree. You'll need that. I'll start with a bit of an, ad um, of an admission that I've never made before. I'm terrified of speaking in public. Yes, I'm nervous to be standing here, and it's not only because I was worried the university would look into my grades and reveal my not-so-sterling GPA, but I'm worried, I was worried to be standing here because public speaking has never come easy for me. This may sound like a surprise for someone who spends a lot of their time on television offering um, commentary on the politics of the day or asking questions of the president or other officials at the White House, but it's true. I'm frightened of public speaking. But it's because of the University of Nebraska that I'm able to. Not because of my journalism degree. My journey on campus actually began much earlier. I started coming here when I was five years old, when I had trouble speaking a full sentence. I knew what I wanted to say, but I couldn't get the words out. I was stammering and stuttering and gasping for air. So I spent a lot of time at Barclays Center on the East Campus here often sitting in silence as a group of speech pathologists helped me get the words out. I will always be grateful to them. And while I didn't know it at the time, this period taught me some valuable life lessons. Step outside of your comfort zone, confront your fears, challenge yourself, and don't be afraid of failing. I grew up on a farm outside of Exeter, Nebraska. It's a small town about an hour west of here. My high school class had 12 students, and for as long as I can remember, I wanted to be a reporter. I wanted to tell stories, ask questions, and be um, on the front row uh, to whatever was happening in our country and the world, a front row seat to history. Our high school was too small to have a newspaper, so I found one nearby. I worked at the York News Times. I can promise you, I never sat around those days thinking that I would have the job I have today. But when I was actually interviewing for my current job, I thought about sharing this sort of oddity, the York News Times, the New York Times, but I wasn't sure my Ivy League editors would find it as amusing as I did. <laughs> now I kind of wish I would have, because when I was in Times Square that day in New York City just six years ago, it's true, if it hadn't been for the building blocks here in Nebraska, I wouldn't have been sitting there. As you all begin the next chapter of your lives, the long-range future may seem daunting, but think of it instead in small chapters, with one step leading to another. And along the way, something else will automatically come into play, your Nebraska brand. You all are entering a world that is more interconnected than ever before. Whether you stay here in Nebraska or you find yourself living somewhere far away, either choice is fine. You are all citizens of the world. We're living in a new economy, regardless of our address. The University of Nebraska, though, has given you an early glimpse of what this is like. Just one small example here out of many on this campus. Look at the Water for Food Institute at UNL. People from 28 countries around the world traveled here to look at research for water. 
the people sitting right around you are coming from 34 states and 28 countries around the world. I was never sure if I would be able to compete with students from elsewhere. It wasn't until my last summer in college, during an internship at the Wall Street Journal, when I started to see that I actually might be able to do that. I spent that summer at the Journal's uh, New England Bureau in Boston. My boss said he hired me for one reason. I still remember him smiling as he said, this will drive the kids from Harvard nuts. <laughs> the power of your Nebraska brand is strong. It means hardworking and humble, honest and humane. Your Nebraska roots are an irreplaceable part of your brand. Some of you are Nebraskans by birth. Some of you are Nebraskans because you chose to attend college here. But it will always be a part of your brand and a source of confidence. I finished another year of chasing politicians across the country. And in each of these four presidential campaigns I've covered, I always start with one question. Who is from Nebraska? There's always someone who knows someone from Nebraska. And this is a ready-made social network, a built-in community wherever you are. I live in Washington now, and when people ask how a farm kid from Nebraska ended up there, I tell them, I drove east. <laughs> it's true, I did slowly move east. My first job was at the Des Moines Register, then at the Chicago Tribune, and now I'm at the New York Times. For me, this was not part of a master plan when I walked across the stage in 1996. It was a mixture of luck, as well as acting on that luck, and by working harder than anyone ever expected me to, and not being intimidated by setbacks or failure. Each one of those stops for me has opened a fresh window on the world that I never imagined when I was growing up in Exeter. If I'd been riding on Air Force One with President Bush or President Obama, visiting a refugee camp in Northern Africa, or traveling across China. Many of you are already well-seasoned travelers. Some of you will never be. And both of those are OK, as long as you expose yourself to foreign experiences wherever you are. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, and a college dropout whose vision is responsible for not only the devices in our pockets, but also how we experience the world, may have said it best a few years ago when he delivered a commencement address shortly after he learned he was dying of cancer. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life, he said. Don't be trapped by dogma which is living with the results of people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and your intuition. Indeed, time is limited. As our thoughts and prayers are with the victims of the unthinkable shootings in Connecticut yesterday, we should all be inspired and committed to make the most of our lives and opportunities in a world that can sometimes be cruel. In closing, I will refrain from offering you any advice. That's one thing I do remember from my graduation. In the days before I left UNL, I was having a beer with Ed Howard. He was a longtime Nebraska journalist who is known for his salty wisdom and humor. When I asked him for advice, he looked at me and said, kid, never ask anyone for a piece of advice. Ask them for their thoughts, then you can decide whether you want to follow it. I've never forgot that, even though we actually went on to have a long evening that night. But, so my thoughts are these. It doesn't matter as we sit here today if you aren't exactly sure that you know what you want to do. Find something that intrigues you, inspires you, and excites you. And then go after it and work harder than anyone expects you to do. Try something that scares you. Meet people with a different point of view, no matter if you live in Beatrice or in Beijing. And above all, believe in yourselves. Finally, don't spend all weekend, at least this weekend, worrying about your job interviews. You may have a little room for error here. During my job interview with the New York Times in 2006, one of the top editors asked if I thought Senator Barack Obama, at the time a young senator from Illinois, would run for president in 2008. Not likely, I predicted, with an overinflated sense of authority. Hillary Rodham Clinton is far too strong, and he knows his place. So I got the job, and less than a year after that, I turned out to be dead wrong. But by then, I was the only one who remembered, and I've never mentioned it again. <laughs> so I wish you very good luck in your ventures ahead, and until then, go Big Red. <laughs>